Hi, my name is Jeff. Jeff Nelson. Uh, and I play horn. And I grew up on a pig farm about 10 miles north of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, and uh, yeah, I love music. I love chamber music. I did a lot of chamber music, a lot of orchestra playing. Uh, played on Broadway for a year and did a bunch of other Broadway shows and did movie soundtracks and video games and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about where I'm, where we're coming from. So you, if you have questions about different things, you know what to ask about. Uh, I love entrepreneurship. I'm pretty obsessed about it now. And my big thing is fearless performance, uh, which is basically I'm developing a way and a system where people can close the quality gap between what they can do and what they actually do in performance. So you can bring all that stuff you do in the practice room, on stage, in performance, and just be you wherever you're performing. Be your authentic self. And there's a real process through which I've been studying it and learning it and now teaching it. Because I have a quality gap too. I think everybody does. Um, but I ran a fitness company in Toronto for a while, and then with Canadian Brass, we were self-run as well. So running that type of entrepreneurship, and really excited to try and help other people. Um, thrive and get out there because music is not in trouble, just the old paradigms are, so we've got lots of opportunities out there. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know, did it influence you to grow up on a pig farm and have ham and cheese? I had to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought of it when I got <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> okay, I'm a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and I also play the violin. You know, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's important to be a comedian in this <laughs> life, I think. In any case, my name is Georgia Fanzanis, and I am a professor of violin here and slash orchestral studies. And the reason for the slash orchestral studies is that I have a 30-year veteranship in three major orchestras in this country. <coughs> uh, it sounds impressive, and in some level, I still am kind of amazed at what I've done with my life, but I'm not, if I think about the things I know we're gonna cover here today, which is a, making a very firm decision that is founded in uh, understanding deeply what it takes to achieve those goals. In other words, it's, we can all sit here and dream our way to oblivion, but the, po the point here is to be really honest and listen carefully to your mentors who guide you, uh, because there's gotta be an honesty there that I think will help to give you the strength to achieve the things that you wanna achieve. In any case, um, I was very fortunate to have good mentors, and I was a slow starter, I will say that, um, a very late bloomer, I would even say in the sense that I don't think I woke up, but when I woke up, I really woke up. And I really decided what I wanted to do was gonna require the things that fortunately I had in front of me to help train me. And um, I, as I went through my orchestral career, I always taught, and I taught privately, but also orchestral studies. So that when it came time for me to make a change in my career and become a teacher full time, it was absolutely imperative that I created a kind of orchestral workshop atmosphere uh, to be able to, I guess in a certain sense, um, fill out and dispense utterly everything that I know about what I spent 30 years doing day after day. And that's a lot of information, that's a lot of, a lot of everything. And the more I've been away from it, this is my fifth year here, uh, the more I understand the remarkable things that I, I had in those 30 years, aside from the repertory, which is magnificent. But, you know, to go from a section player to a leadership position to the leader um, was a path that has shaped me greatly. And um, I would like to keep learning. That's, that's my goal for the next X years, mm -hmm. however years there are ahead. Okay, that's my opening notes. Fantastic. Well, um, I guess the, the focus of this conversation is about preparing yourself for a career. And because, as Jeff mentioned, the, the world of music is changing as much as it is, um, I guess it'd be really interesting, I think, for us all to discuss what it is that we could be doing here specifically in terms of the changing world. And what things we need to make sure that we've achieved by the time we enter into that world so that we know that we're equipped to be able to handle it. So maybe Jeff, you could start off by just talking about 
tell the world is changing, <coughs> how the focus of attention is moving away from simply getting a job to building a life in music, and, and what sort of the, how you need to feel equipped to be able to handle that, and what, what, what specifically people could be doing here in Bloomington to prepare themselves. Yeah, great. I think the change is from getting a job to making a career, basically. And those are words, but it's a real approach thing that you can own instead of go and ask some orchestras to hire you or some opera companies or churches or organ opportunities. You're, you have to create, you get to create it. <laughs> and you can put your stuff online and be making it public is probably the first step, I think, to figure out who you are. I'm all about quotes. There's a lot of great quotes out there, more than ever now, right, with Pinterest. And, <laughs> oh, so great. Um, and one is, I think the big, it says something about the biggest tragedy is not finding out what you want to do, but finding out who, you, not finding out who you are. And we have, so we start there, I think. And it's, that's the best way to wake up in the morning, I think. Um, for, before we get into maybe the nuts and bolts of it, though, I want to tell you, as a pig farmer in the room, any more pig farmer, I mean, might not be the only pig farmer in the room, but, but I'm a pig farmer who's, who's toured the world over and over and over again, played Carnegie Hall a dozen times, Played with New York, Chicago, Boston, Philly, and Cleveland. All the like this, done these crazy things as a pig farmer. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. Please hear this really loudly. Do it. It has it all has to do with is how much do you want it, and obstacles are the things you see when you take your eyes off your goal. Um, so it's really important to have a dream, I think, and you can have a different one tomorrow. Uh, I think someone said that they weren't sure what they wanted to be in 10 years. Don't be sure. <laughs> But have an idea and wake up with that goal <clears throat> and be going toward that. I think that's where to start. Uh, can I go anywhere with this? Go, go there's, no, there's no written rule about how this conversation goes. Um, I'll just, one structure I give, and we're making sheets to do this. I got this out of a book called um, uh, Getting Things Done The Art of Stress Free Productivity by David Allen. Uh, it's a great book, and he's got an app called Things as well. Um, but two things. One, the way he defined work, and I've probably changed it now, but I really like it. It's work is the thing you put to something to take it from its present state to the state you want it to be in. So for example, if you're going into the practice room to do an hour of practice, that's not a very high goal. <laughs> you're gonna put in the hour and now you've succeeded. Um, it's another saying, most people don't aim too high and miss, they aim too low and hit. <laughs> if you are just putting in the hours, it's what I call pinata practicing. Kind of swing it away and you'll get a little better. But, but or think about where you want this thing to go. And it's more purposeful work along the way. So this, and the other thing I got from him was that you never do a project. You only do enough ta tasks that end up adding up together to complete your project. And that took a lot of stress and weight off of me when I was getting an audition list ready. So, um, and I'll explain in a minute. In the, well in the, yeah, that I allot my tasks and if I do five tasks today, I've moved my project along a little bit, but I don't have to get this whole list ready every day and carry this weight 24 seven, that's exhausting. So an example of my, my system is dreams, goals, projects, tasks. And have the dream out there, be looking at it, waking up. Uh, another saying I made up was, uh, success not only comes to those who want it the most, it comes to those who want it the most often. So have your reminders everywhere, your post-it notes, and really, and I'm an idiot, I forget in an instant. <laughs> I walk up to one room in the house and go, what am I doing here? Oh crap, I gotta go back downstairs and figure out why. I'm glad so, you're not doing it. Yeah, oh my gosh, exactly. So have your reminders, have your system. Uh, and then have your dream, and then for my, an example for me is to make a living in music and be a performer and make some money and what's it called, eat. Be able to eat. Um, and then my goal uh, was the Montreal Symphony audition. And then the, ta the projects was each excerpt on the list. And then the tasks were the front of the first note of Tosco H5. This is what I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and look at. And make sure a lot and manage your tasks well every day. But that's, I'll get maybe further into the management part of it. So that's an example of a system you guys can be thinking about. Have your dream and be looking and go where the world isn't. There was no Canadian brass before Canadian brass. You know, they created it and got to be able to do it. Now more than ever, we can create things this building wasn't here before it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying true things, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to actually tag on a little quote, since we're in quote land. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's oh, too much to remember all this stuff, but maybe it, it all starts to trigger each other. This is a, really came from a really good friend of mine who's an educator and uh, a good thinker. And 
it's, these are the words of Howard Thurman, who was an African American, uh, who was a philosopher, educator, uh, theologian, uh, just a generally wise person, dealing with obviously a very dynamic kind of life that would have turmoil in it from day one, and he fought to go to the place where he would find the most um, gratifying way of consolidating the trials of his life into a very positive um, uh, state of being and, and, and reaching out to a larger audience. And some people, I guess, have that in them to reach out way beyond very specific things. And I, I'm always very appreciative of running into the words or writings of those people. Anyway, his, his words to you today are, <coughs> don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. I just love that. All right. <laughs> Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I, that to me is a question that's being said now over and over again in a way. Um, the self-discovery um, has to be something where you, uh, these things are coming from inside you. You perceive the world, you perceive what's out there, what your options are, what you've had experience, contact with, whether it's going to an orchestra concert, going to a jazz concert, going to uh, uh, whatever, whatever it is, watching television and seeing something that affected you. What, any countless number of ways that you're affected by what is possible out there in the world. The next thing is you can, you can respond to it and you can suddenly feel some kind of identification to it. But the important thing that's next is this thing that I think that Jeff is talking about. You have to come actively into a relationship that is daily, a daily sort of feeding off of this, this little, mm, what do we want to call it, this little spark, this something that makes you feel like the person that you are, not trying to be somebody that you are not. And I see that actually a lot since I live in an environment where a lot of people around me are trying to discover themselves. And I think there are lots of givens about, you know, you could do this, 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 and this out in the world, or you can make things up and then say, I would actually like to do this and this and this, and it's not there yet. That's a little scary, but I do believe that if you follow this little philosophy, if you really have come alive with this notion of who you are, you will have the power and the strength to see it through. You will make it happen. I, I have no doubt about that. But it has to be genuine, it has to be authentic. It has to be something that you can't shake, you won't be shaken around in the winds. When you fail at something, whatever that means, you don't get it yet, you just go back. You keep polishing and polishing and possibly rethinking. Is, is this continue to be the thing I want? Is this really it? Can I handle this? And don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck in a place. Um, I see students, oftentimes I can see that they're fighting against this goal, this idea of a goal. And I say, well, is that really your goal? I mean, is that truly the one? Maybe it's something completely different. Have you ever thought of dentistry? <laughs> Have you ever thought of, you know, running a pig farm? I mean, whatever it is, there, there are too many things that you probably don't understand you could be. And you get, we do get focused into one thing because, of course, that's how our culture works. You know, I get yourself identified, get in there, and become that thing from an early age. It's good, and yet it's very possible to get off the, the track, the beaten track of this. And I'm, I'm only guess I'm saying things that are just truth, not necessarily like I know the answer to all this stuff, except that's, those are the truths that I've watched and I've seen and that I believe you should have some, at least a, a sense of the answers are not necessarily all out here. A lot of it really has to come from you. I remember the first time I heard, well, for me, seminal. It was a moment when I heard the first time the Brahms First Symphony, and I was, I was maybe 10, and there was, believe it or not, they were selling records at the AMP store, which was a grocery store. You know, so we got, my parents would buy these albums, you know, for some ridiculously low price, 
and they put them in the basement. So I went one day and I just, you know, opened one box up and I put this record on and I had no idea what, I didn't even look to see what was first. And suddenly this gigantic monumental thing started pounding toward me. And I just, I just levitated. I'd never been in the presence of something so incredibly magnificent and bigger than me and larger than me and yet talking to me. And I thought, whatever that is, I have to go there. I mean, I just came alive that day. I came, I, I woke up. And whether I, I understood it, I don't know. All I know is that I then went after that, day after day. That one moment changed the idea of what defined life. And I think that kind of deep sense of, of being alive is really, really crucial in your work. Very crucial. Well said. <laughs> hey, man. And when I, know, I mean, this reminds me of a story too, where if, if you cry about this, there's been lots of tears shed in my studio. Um, most of the time, students. Sometimes, me too. But, um, <laughs> and uh, I just watched Moulin Rouge last night. Um, but I mean, I was with a student a while ago, and, and she, you know, crying. I was probably crying too. And I was like, "Well, what if I do all the work and I don't get what I want?" And I was like, "I don't know. Have you done it yet?" No. Well, boring question. Next, moving on. And she's like, "You're right. Okay." <laughs> But now she's thriving. She's doing really well. The, the world decides whether you deserve it or not. And there's guidelines and hoops and all the stuff that we got to go through to get what we want or create it. But that's not that's not our decision. I'm, I was shocked every time I won an audition. Really, that was good enough because I missed this and this and this. But yep, it's relative, and we're we're all we're imperfect anyway. But how good can it be? And, and we put all our stock in that, making it as good as it can be, and learning which hoops it needs to fit through if it does. Um, but it's how much do you want it and then will I do the work yes or no and if it's yes go do the work it's not about, and then and keep figuring it out heads down you know I kind of have some goals and I would go from one audition to the next and go and make sure I win that audition go in training mode for three months don't ask me to a movie but you can ask me to play an excerpt for you you know it's real intense stuff that I'm writing out I can send you the PDF on an audition, my audition training system but it's how much do you want it and just keep stumbling toward that goal and make it about what to do as well as a really big thing, solution-based stuff. Well, you know, it's, I agree with you. I never really believed I was going to win that audition. I mean, I worked hard, and when I won those auditions, um, I absolutely thought uh, there, there must be something there that's other than the system that I have broken my back to try to learn, which is what's wrong with me, what's wrong with this. What, you know, what do I need to keep polishing? And of course, you need to have those daily expectations. You need to really look in and analyze where you are and where you need to be all the time. But the fact of the matter is you are getting more and more who you are and you're polishing you. And that you is the you that comes across in the audition. Your skills are, of course, they have to be well considered when you walk into an audition. Well considered meaning you have to, you have to really have done your homework. But because what what you just said, we're not all perfect, and <coughs> human beings are not expected to be perfect. CDs are perfect, but they're a manufactured kind of perfection, in my opinion. I mean, if I watch an old recording of a person who's just playing straight through, that to me is a magnificent example of real artistry and concentration and focus. And yes, there are little mm -mm -mm's around the edges. You know, I listen to a Milstein performance, and not too many, but it's incredible what I'm hearing. I'm not listening to those things. In an audition, oftentimes the little things that happen are not the essence of it. It's really the content of your personality that is connected to this incredible subject, which is music. Um, I mean, music itself already carries so, such discipline. You, if you're in this, you're already pretty disciplined. So you have a, a kind of, of a network of of expectations of yourself, dividing things in, in time, knowing how to actually hold the tempo because you've worked with a metronome and you've, you've understood the ability to move in time consecutively. You've understood the idea of dynamics, which is energy. And so you've understood how to impact your body energy and your motion into creating dynamics. Expression, I mean, there's zillions of colors of expression that every piece asks of you nuances so you've been dealing in that all of these areas have already been introduced to you you have to just keep filling that in with your own personal 
signature, which is to be musically authentic when you're playing. Your music, you, who you are. But also, look at the world at large. You've got so many examples to look at now of what people consider really outstanding achievements. So look at those achievements and be excited about that. I mean, actually kind of humbled by it all the time. I mean, I, I still listen to people that just, you know, just reduced me to like a little <coughs> piano. You know, I felt so insignificant. I could never play, I could never play the violin like that. You know, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna play the violin like Heifetz. I, I will never play the violin like Heifetz. I'm not Heifetz. And literally, I'm not him. I mean, he achieved something That's magnificent. That's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. I, I could never be that person. So it's real important to not get off on a tangent. I, I want to be like that person. <coughs> We'd miss out on who she is, you know. Just in, like, what a loss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And you guys are all, when you walk out on stage or into an interview or if you're meeting your future mate in life, whatever, all these different performance-based things, um, you are the collection of what you, it's all performance in any way, you know, the general thing, but um, that you can tell I'm obsessed with girls' performance, um, that you are the collection, either way, and you can walk out on stage and ask, is this right, or is this a good regurgitation, or here's my version, here you go, and you decide either way, and you're fully focused on giving your version, since it is, your, the, I made up a, a Facebook post graphic thing that says, one of the quotes I made up was, um, the greatest performers in the world walk out on stage and say, here's what I think. So do the lame performers, <laughs> or the unhirable performers. Everybody says, here's what I think. And some people are asking on stage, and other people are trying to regurgitate. And well, what's your story? And what do you, when you've listened to all these different recordings and collected, and you decide what's important either way. So you might as well, and I've, what's important I want you guys to hear pretty loudly is that I have missed notes in every audition I've won. Big, and I was very lucky that my teacher told me that early in my training. That the guy that was the first horn in Montreal, he missed more notes than everyone else, but they couldn't not hire him because he made so much music. And those mistakes are not heard when the phrase is going to that last note. You know? yeah. And, and on, in, the, in performances, I mean, these things happen. I mean, it's, it, I mean, really the idea of getting freaked out about imperfections is, it's about what you do next, the way you go on from there. It's the way that you keep rising above your frailty, let's say, to the next height. In effect, I think you're stronger when you make a mistake, if you're on the right track. You're, you're not gonna be deflated. And that is often what happens in auditions. Something happens, and then you think, that's it, I've been exposed, I'm a goner. And then you just your boat just goes Which is <coughs> exactly the kind of lack of, of true immersion in what you're doing that can bring you down. I mean, you, ha you have to be a little bit, in a sense, gutsy, and as I say to my students, you gotta be a warrior. You, you, you have to be a warrior. If you're not a warrior and you're not crusading on behalf of your own love and commitment to what you're doing, um, then you're basically gonna fall victim to what you perceive and what you think. Oh, they did, you know, when students ask me, you know, well, what are they gonna want? What, you know, what are they looking for? I said, I don't know, I'm not sitting on that panel. I can't possibly tell you what they're looking for. Um, if they're any good, they're gonna be looking for dynamics, <laughs> tempo, um, holding tempo, understanding the, the actual excerpt and what, how it works inside that piece. Um, you have a good sense of, of dynamicism in your playing, that you're not playing everything piano and, or mezzo piano, worse. Um, and you're, you're engaged. That's what a committee wants, just what Jeff just said. If you are, if you are music, total music, that's, that's usually what wins an audition. There's a, a book by Daniel Pink called Drive, the cu okay. curious truth of what mo motivates, the surprising truth about what motivates us. And he describes the old paradigm of why we do anything uh, was the carrot or the stick, to either win the prize, get the carrot, or avoid the punishment, the stick. And then, but this new paradigm I love, and it's exactly what they're um, either testing you on in an audition or what you can celebrate and show, you know, share in your performance. And it's mastery, is the reason why we do things now, this new paradigm I love. Mastery, to get good at something. Meaning, like to put me music and passion and story into your music. And then autonomy is the third thing, and that's to be self-sufficient. So you're showing, that's why there's no 
orchestra with you when you're doing a lot of your audition. And can you count to four <laughs> symmetrically on your own? You know, and that autonomy goes into all areas of our life too. Can we get up in time and get there on time and all those things that we can, but I love that clarity of the three things that motivate us. Get good at something, have some meaning in it, and do it my and be self-sufficient. I take that quite a bit further when I walk into a performance where my goal is not to make them feel a certain thing. My goal is not to win an audition. My goal is not to win a competition or any of those things. My goal is to share my greatest Mozart that I've collected and made. And when I come up to the romantic line before I walk out on that stage, that's what I get onto, is I'm gonna share now. And that's all I can control, is my sharing my Mozart. They're gonna decide either way. Maybe their dog died and they're not listening. Maybe I can't control that. So my goals are, are autonomous. They're something I can achieve. Now when I share my greatest Mozart, I end up winning the audition or getting hired and doing all these things. But on the, in the moment of execution, all I'm doing is sharing and, do, and executing, like the gold for the Olympic athletes. Really much more simple thing. Yeah. Um, I, it's funny how we're creating, obviously, a little universe over here <laughs> of opinions and, and knowledge and philosophy, and it's, it's, it's marvelous. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's got a lot of, it's sending out a lot of vibrations into the room. It occurs to me that you know how do we, how do we come to understand what Mozart is? How do we how do we understand what a great jazz performance is? How do we understand, you know, how to play the cello magnificently? To me, you should spend a lot of time listening to the people that have marched behind you. In other words, we have recorded history of people going back to the early part of the century, twentieth century. Those. Phenomenal musicians, in my opinion, and what set the gold standard for the possibilities of, ex of music existing in the world. And you need to hear those people. You, you need to study them. You need to be around them. You need to taste what, let's say, you know, what a, an Arthur Schnabel, how he treats a phrase in a Schubert sonata. You need to, these people are, in a sense, the, the ones that carry the lineage from even the time of Beethoven. And we have to understand there, there is a kind of progression here and don't just look at this slice right now at this moment. Um, I mean, I actually consider the thing that is my collection of Mozart to be the countless, countless performances of singers and opera that I've listened to, particularly opera with Mozart, and great performances by people that have studied it as a performance practice, like, um, Thomas Zaitmeyer. There are a lot of violinists who've, who've looked at this very differently, Victoria Molova. I mean, there, there's so many interesting looks back in history and that are part of a legacy and tradition. It's good to know the traditions. It's good to know what came before and to understand the greatness. What is greatness? I don't even know. It's, it's achievement. It's really a, it's a kind of achievement. And I'm inspired. I mean, I'm definitely inspired when I go back and listen to somebody who really is part of the great legacy of our profession. And it can be anything. I just today got sent something about, uh, it was a skit of Sid Caesar's. This man at age, I don't know how old he was. Um, if you don't know who he is, you know, go on YouTube and see anything of his, please. He's a genius. Anyway, he's a comedian, but he was a brilliant and very musical comedian. And he stood up in front of an audience and spoke in four languages so convincingly but in gibberish. And it's, I mean, the intonation is perfect, the, the diction, the flavor, it was French, German, Italian, and Japanese. And I mean, talk about, and it was done completely exuberantly without any sort of, I'm thinking about this, I'm gonna think about this and I'm gonna do this. He just looked at the audience and it was like the audience just fed him the energy that he needs. And I think that's a good thing to talk about is the energy that's involved in a, being a performer, a performer and in the live performance. It's true even in, a, even in a lesson. A lesson is a performance in a certain sense too, when you're teaching. When you're really on the line, you really have to do something to really impart it. But there is, there are marimbas in the room. <laughs> um, okay, what was I saying? Energy. 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 Your energy. I'm feeling your energy. Your energy is, you're very captive, you're very quiet, but you're very focused. 
And you're affecting the way I'm talking, I'm sure. He's smiling a lot. He looks really animated and exuberant. And the two of you together create a very interesting counter dynamic. <laughs> and I feel that. I mean, I feel that. That's really affecting me. I mean, sitting next to Jeff is affecting me. I mean, you're, you're drawing, you know, we're humans. We're energy. We're an energy source. And we are feeding off of each other and responding all the time. It's just like a bouncing thing. And an audience is the most, well, it's the most natural kind of actually, I don't know, drug, yeah. cheap, cheap, except that you have to pay very dearly to be able to walk out on stage and deliver and receive that drug. But there is something about the idea of that celebration when you come together and there is an absolutely committed group of people who come there to enjoy whatever you're about to do. Um, it could be in the room, it could be uh, because it's a recording that you made and you're thinking about that as you're making it. It could be about the way you're gonna write a piece of music. By the way, are you related to that Curtis, Curtis Smith? No. no. No, I'm sure you've been asked that eight million times. I'm sorry. Curtis M. Smith, you see Curtis. Ah, okay, got it, got it. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I think you have to be not afraid of, okay, that brings me to the next thing I was gonna read to you. I guess this is just the way it leads in. And this is a poem. Uh, by a very, very smart, sharp <coughs> Minnesotan, Bill Holm. And if you don't know any of his, he's, he was a music lover, very intelligent man about music. A lot of his poetry is about music. Um, I mean, all kind of music. He was, a, he was a sort of a jazz pianist, and also he was classically trained. Um, anyway, this is a movie called Advice. So since we're here in that mode, uh, I thought I should read this. Advice by Bill Holm. <clears throat> Someone dancing inside us has learned only a few steps. The do your work in 4-4 four, four time and the what do you expect waltz. He hasn't noticed yet the woman standing away from the lamp, the one with black eyes who knows the rumba and strange steps in jumpy rhythms from the mountains of Bulgaria. If they dance together, something unexpected will happen. If they don't, the next world will be a lot like this one. Ooh. So, there's a wild person in you. There, uh, there are things inside of you that are uncharted and the or unknown. Or a calm person for the wild ones. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I mean, there's like an opposite something in potential in all of us. I mean, you can say a dark side and a light side. You can say however you want to say it. But there's, there's the combustion of these things <clears throat> that can suddenly, you know, again, maybe be the trigger for who you really are and is going to make you come alive. It's this thing about how do we get to this expressing something that's visceral, you know? You wonder about in tribes, you know, how did the people know they were going to be, like, in primitive times? How did they know they were going to be the medicine person or the, or the you know, Actually, this is, a, this is really interesting. Somebody went to an island off the coast of um, New Zealand. It's somewhere very remote. I mean, you have to take a, a little ship, and then you have to take a little canoe. I don't know, it's something incredibly remote. And these people on this island only sing. Singing is what they do every day. They're constantly singing. And the person who's the head of the tribe is the loudest singer. <laughs> now, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, that would be inspiring to try to be the loudest singer <laughs> and want to do that, you know, and want to do that. <coughs> um, it, so, yeah. Maybe we've been carrying on enough. What do you think? Uh, should we open it up? You guys yeah, want to ask questions? Just open up to questions. Yeah, I mean, you guys should feel free to now just, you know. I okay, add one really quick thing on what she's talking about with the caring about it and what do you care about and finding out what you care. Uh, I have four things in the Thrills Performance structure, and it's uh, diligence, uh, clarity, management, and courage. And these, I can explain them at some point. But the first one is diligence, and it's and do your daily diligence and all of these things. And it's um, it's different than discipline. Diligence comes from the Latin root to care deeply. So imagine starting your first practice session or your first minute with your friend or whatever, and be caring deeply about it and do the work because you care about it rather than because you should. That discipline is told to you or told to us that we should be doing this or that. Or, but diligence is, 
it's to care and to do some caring work and moving it toward what you care about. And I think that brings us more alive than the other <clears throat> dis disciplined work. I think it goes way deeper. And it's pretty exciting. And I've seen massive shifts in my life and my students when we changed it to dis uh, to diligence in that caring way. What yeah. were the other three again? Um, clarity. Clarity. Okay. And that's basically the combination of knowledge, uh, intellect, and smartness. Mm -hmm. like knowledge is your library. Know everything. Know seven languages if you have time, but we only have 24-7 and you gotta get some sleep. Um, and you gotta watch some Walking Dead episodes. <laughs> um, and then intelligence is accessing your knowledge. And then uh, there's growth and learning. There's a bunch of things in here. Growth and learning, how you learn and how you collect things. And then smarts. And that's the most important one, what I'm developing the most, and that's the ability to have the right one or two things on your mind at any point. And that's when you do mock auditions and run things and figure out what that one thought is before you start that, that excerpt or, or compose that bar or whatever you're doing. It's being smart. You can never be too smart. If, you're be, if you have too much on your mind, you're not being smart. You're being intelligent and too intelligent. Oh, this person's in the audience. Will that help you at all in performance? No. So let go of that and get smart. This bar, two, three, and tanks coming into Russia or whatever you need for your story. And you've habited the rest. So that's clarity. Uh, what, what do you know? First one's diligence, care. Clarity is no management, is balance. So manage your life. And these are all deal breakers or deal makers. If you, you can't not manage yourself, you can be the greatest heart player in the world and do all this stuff, and if you show up late for your audition, it doesn't help at all, right? So you manage your time, your schedule, your food, your energy, relationships, your career, all these different aspects, and you're looking into all that so that your life is balanced. And have your arguments with your friends at another time or whatever you're doing. And then the last one's courage, to act, to do the thing you're afraid of and to look into that and get internal fortitude and build on that and become a warrior. <laughs> in your way, be able to do that. Yeah. So that, and then basically you're building, 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 building. You're backstage. You're making all your choices and building. You come up to what I call the magic line. I do magic as a hobby. Magic line between backstage and on stage. Every time we enter any performance situation, we bring every choice we've made up to the line, and then we cross the line with whatever choices that serve us best, and then we're sharing. And that's it. That's all we're doing. Build, share, build, share, build, share. Keep making it better, and one day we die. <laughs> exciting! It's <laughs> an exciting. <laughs> well, maybe you should throw in, and we get inspired. I mean, I each time we can choose either way. Yeah, and then when we perform, and you cross the line the other way, and you're backstage again, you can choose. And I've stopped saying be positive, because that's just putting a smile on everything and all this stuff. But be constructive. And sometimes going home and crying for two days and mourning your loss is the most constructive thing you can do. Then you come back and choose and get more inspired and do better work after, if that's what you meant. So I've been, uh, the book, The Outsiders, The Outliers, sorry, Outliers. Outliers. Yeah, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it talks a lot about opportunity and pairing of, uh, you know, having put in the work and then the opportunities that present themselves, seizing those opportunities and kind of hoping to be ready for those opportunities that come along in history. And so I was wondering if, if you might be able to tell some stories, maybe some critical moments in your careers, uh, of perhaps some opportunities that you had that you were able to seize upon because of the work you've done, or mm -hmm. just like a story that... <laughs> well, all right, I'll start with, maybe it's, again, a defining moment. Mm -hmm. A defining moment. Um, I was, uh, I'd been trained orchestrally to do that as my life. I, I knew that. And when I actually got a very important first job, which was in San Francisco with the San Francisco Symphony, I also uh, ended up going there, unbeknownst to me, to meet my future husband, who I did. And then um, the result of the fact that that person was a very <coughs> wise and incredibly brilliant musician in his own right, a writer and a teacher, musicologist, etc. I suddenly had access to a lot of information I did not have before, way beyond what I probably would have ever had access to just if I'd gone on my own, because this is a person that every day would sit and talk to me, and suddenly I knew five different American composers I'd never heard of, 
and hearing about new music and hearing about the very neglected composers um, who were brilliant and who deserved uh, hearings and, and advocacy by musicians, I became kind of jumped on board this whole cause. Now, whether I was going to do it was another matter, but if I was going to marry this band, I was going to do it. And I became just com totally committed to that idea. Then when the opportunity came to me through the offices of the music director to play the Violin Concerto by Roger Sessions, it was a piece that had not been played in a long, long time. Um, and Roger Sessions was somebody that my husband actually knew at Princeton. And suddenly, this was not just a new piece of music that was actually an old piece of music, um, but it was a composer that I didn't know, but the person that I was married to knew this man. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's just very interesting. You know, we play Brahms, we don't know these people, we, we just assume we're supposed to do that, but suddenly I'm playing somebody whose music this person actually sat in front of and watched eat. You know, and that made it very vivid to me as the cause for my saying, you know, that's, that's somebody I should care, really care about, somebody who really isn't known. And when I went to get the music and look at it, after I'd been asked to learn it, uh, or would I like to learn it, and I opened the first page, thought, mm -hmm. holy moly, mm -hmm. this is friggin' hard. <laughs> this is gonna be the hardest thing I have ever learned in my life. And I was not gonna play with music, I knew that. The only way you can sell a piece, in my, in my mind, of this kind, was to memorize it. You know, then I went over to the second page, and the third page, and I'm thinking, okay, there goes my life. <laughs> there, there goes the next several months of my life. And then I thought, no, that's not the way to look at this. This is gonna be the most, imp maybe one of the most important things I ever do. And it was because of that moment of saying, of course, this is exactly what I should be doing. This is, this is where I came alive. When I saw that, I came alive, and I thought, I'm gonna say yes. And of course, I put in work of a kind that I'd never put in before studying a piece. I, because it was just wild territory for me, completely unknown to me. The language is a lot like Brahms, actually, and that, that was something that was very helpful for me to know from talking to my husband about him. But through that performance and working with that music director who then moved on and left San Francisco and went to Minnesota, that call came one day when he said, you know what, I'm thinking of changing the concertmaster in Minnesota and I want you to consider coming. And he said, I know the work that you did, I know what you're capable of, and you're who I want in this chair. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, the back-breaking, in my mind, necessary work for, for the sake of music. And I think that's what's very important about this story. It wasn't about me at all. In fact, the fact I got a reward, in a sense it was a reward, but ha ha. I mean, being a concertmaster is not, it's a reward of a kind. It's hard work and it takes real warriorship of a kind that I can only just say, you, if you're weak or you're meek, don't think about it. You've gotta be, you've gotta have nerves of steel, you've gotta have the resilience of, you know, the strongest t material known to man or woman. <laughs> Um, so it was about my commitment to music. It was about that that moved me forward. And I think that's a very important thing. It's about your hard work that is gonna make you stand out. A lot of people coasting through life. A lot of people that are coasters. Or tourists, I like to say. <laughs> you know, they look at the book and, oh, uh, 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 okay, it's fine. Now I know Paris. So that's my story. I'm sure you have an equal story to seminal uh um, i mean the opportunity thing i used to think that we uh we it's not the best thing for us to be at the mercy of our emotions and to be dictated by the emotions and i like to think that we can think again we have a thought and then we feel we never feel in a vacuum right there's a thought that inspires that emotion but then we can think again. <clears throat> I think that's maybe an important thing for you guys when the opportunities come to you and these stories about opportunities is what do you do when that opportunity is there? So the premise to one of my stories was that I was looking for summer jobs while I was at university and I applied to 20 different um, construction companies. Uh, I grew up on a farm so I wanted to do some work and 
uh, make some money. And uh, I got one job and I was standing there talking to the guy and it was a construction job and we travel, we go through, we can go in British Columbia, Alberta and Saskatchewan and you get paid for travel time as well and you, you, uh, you're gonna get in shape, you're working outside and all these things. And I was like, okay, great, 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 yeah. And we're building uh, communication towers, 300 foot high towers. Okay, I can do that and we don't use safety lines. And it's just, no, 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 no. And I was like, and I, I said, stop, Jeff, think first. And just think again, stop shaking. <laughs> think again, and I still feel that now, and it's pretty amazing. And I said, yes. And I said, okay, this would be good for you. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen? You die, right? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, and I did this job for two summers, and it was the most amazing thing. I have some great stories about the first time up the tower. He gave me a hard hack, a hard hat. Why? I don't know what that would have felt. <laughs> and I start climbing, and I climb things on the farm. So I'm climbing up the tower, and I get 30 feet, and I get above the trees. I'm just supposed to go get the light and replace replace the light. They called it a milk run. Unfortunately, the light's at the top of the damn tower. Um, I get about 40 feet up, and I look. I, what do I, do? I look down, which is fine, but then I look up, and the hard hat comes off. And I remember watching it going. Boom, 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 boom. To hit the tower the way my body would have if I fell. And I was like, okay, where, where'd that thought come from? And the next thing, I am locked into this tower, and I'm like, okay. And I realize that when I switch hands, I'm only holding on with one hand for a second. So I'm like, is that hand okay? Okay. And then I look at it and I shake the hand. And I, you know, the first 10 feet, you know, and you start learning. And I stayed there. The foreman went up past me and did it and came back down. He's like, you coming down? I'm like, uh -huh. <laughs> sure. We got down, went to the next tower, and I got up to the top of this one, just the 75 foot tower. And then you have to belt in, put this leather thing through the, and then lean away and work on <laughs> stuff and replace. And I had my head wrapped in, just trying to get the light bulb anyway. And then fast forward to two months later, and I climbed 300 feet up a tower, 30 stories, up the outside of a tower, and just kind of lean my thumb on, thumb on the tower and put the belt in and then go. And one time a satellite dish was coming down on one of my colleagues on his arm, so I unclipped at 250 feet, climbed like a monkey around these things and swung around and got down and melted in and lifted the 200 foot satellite because I was diligent. I cared about this guy's arm. It's amazing what you can do. Um, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about fearless performance in that thing, and my forearms were like, whoosh, I'm holding on for my life for 16 hours a day, you know? But also, with that much caring, you can work a 14 hour day, and it goes by like that, because you're very focused on what you're doing, much like you know those practice sessions. They go by like, oh, really? It's that time already? When you get into that, into that thing. And if you drop a nut, you had to buy a beer for everyone, because you could kill somebody, and all these different things. So I learned that a lot. And then fast forward to, some other opportunities, uh, Chicago Symphony was having an audition. Everyone else was saying, you don't want to do this. They know who they want to hire. They want someone from Chicago, all this stuff. And I kept saying, okay, are you done? I'm going to, I got to go practice. Are you done doing it? You know? So I was that one idiot who went and kept practicing. And in the finals, it was me and eight people from Chicago out of two, three hundred hornets or whatever. And I either, uh, they were all right. But they wanted someone from Chicago or I was that one idiot who didn't believe in that and didn't. And I practiced like a fool and just went whole at, hard at it. Uh, and then in the final finals, it was me and the two other guys that got the job. I was the other semifinalist. And then what happened from that was they asked me to come to South America and Carnegie Hall. And then uh, Canadian Brass called and hired me instead. And I had just won principal of Vancouver and got to say no to that and all these different things from that. I got to know Dale Clevenger. I spent all my money to come to Chicago three months before, two months before, and one month before. Got to know him a lot in that relationship. Then I, started, then I ended up teaching his son here, and now he's here on faculty. And it's a lot to do with me getting to know him back in 2000, along the way. Uh, another big opportunity, really quick story. Uh, New York City Opera, my wife was singing uh, Suzuki, and saw the premiere on the Friday and then Sunday, I sat down with her mom again, and I looked and one of my students was in the orchestra, and he was waving, and, and 128, I remember this, so I was shutting my phone off, and the call came up, and I was like, uh, and she was like, get it, and I was really gonna, I'll talk to him at the intermission or whatever, and I went, okay. He's like, hey Jeff, uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but we're down one horn player. Do you want to come in? And I haven't played in a week, and I, and I had a black, I had this jacket on probably, and jeans and everything, and I was like, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, seriously? And I was like, yeah. So I got up and ran around all the way to the back and got to the door of the stage, and it was locked, and I was not, and the usher was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And the guy came in, and he was like, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks. And he handed me a tie. My wife was coming backstage down for her opening. 
And she was like, that's my husband's voice. Is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, great. How you doing? Good. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to go play. Have a good show. And she's like, you too. <laughs> I went down and they gave me one mouth. They had lent me a horn and a mouthpiece. And I tried one mouthpiece. I was like, God, no. Played two notes. And then I went to play another one. And the A started. And they started. And then we started playing. And I was playing fourth on uh, Madden Butterfly. But I remember just the first time my wife started singing, I leaned to like, the third horn, I was like this, and he was kind of like, you okay? You know, you can, I was like, yeah, that's my wife singing. And he was kind of like, oh, oh yeah, an opera going on, you know? And she was more afraid than I was. Anyway, so, so I, the story goes, you know, my wife made her debut on the Friday, and I made mine on the Sunday. So, yeah, we got to play together, and it was, it's, it's a good story. And I sort of leap yeah, in, yeah, and yeah. we could have an And you build trust with every time you dive out there, you know, I think, too. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like what you say about feeling alive and finding what, what wakes you up. And, and I think that's really imperative, especially when we're teaching young people. But often what wakes us up is very different from what wakes up someone else. So how have you, in your practice, gone about helping them figure out what, what that is about them? And maybe you don't help them exactly figure it out, but how do you help them to that? Well. Actually, I don't think you cannot not affect somebody. I think, you know, we're, we're covering a lot of ground here to, on this first session. No doubt something that's said just is going to stick with you. And I, I, I just have this feeling that, honestly, there are many lessons that, I, that come and go every week, and I think, did, I, did anything get through to this person? Did I make any kind of an impact on this person? And I'm looking, I'm, oh, I don't think about that for my entire teaching life, I could say that. And what's just interesting to me because I know myself is that there's stuff that's going there that may that may not surface right away that's just planted in there and it's like a little chestnut or like those damn squirrels that are eating like <laughs> bird food right now you know they just packing it in and then they just go out and they eventually eat it you know, through the course of the day and I think you pack stuff away you, you pack it in there some of this makes sense some of this makes a lot of sense to you right now some of it is a little mysterious, and you put it away, and you try to make sense of it. I think mostly if you're talking sensibly and from a real point of view of, of experience with more than just your feelings, but with hardcore knowledge, um, the, more, the more intelligent you are, the better you're gonna make your students. I mean, if you have skill and you have a good sense of humor, I think it's very important. If you're humanly very alive, and compassionate. I think that's incredibly important. Um, I mean, teaching is, it's really about the total human package. And I think so, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's all that. And I, I don't, well, I mean, that, that's just my very nutshell answer to that question. I'm sure you have a basket full of <laughs> This basket? Uh, has just, I mean, there's three. It reminded me of uh, a three-phrase approach that is kind of the filter through which I kind of make choices and and <clears throat> go about when you're full of those nuts and everything. How to process through and it's a filter. So it's uh, learn, love well, and let go. And those are kind of the three things that I do constantly, and it's the serenity prayer. Can I do something about it? Yes or not? Yes or no? If I can, do it, and if not. And let go, you know. And, and there's a great graphic going around Facebook now that you know why worry, right? Can you do th something about it? Great, do it. <laughs> if you can't do anything about it, great. <laughs> then don't like both of those. Don't have worry on the on the mm -hmm. on the on the radar. Um, so how to help other people figure that out? I, I when I do one-off lessons with visiting students that are just having one lesson, I start with three questions. First one's, what do you do away from the horn? Um, so what do you bring to your music? You know, I want to hear a performer who's had their heart broken and, and lived out there. Um, and then, you know, what am I? What, what are we doing here? And, and if I had a magic wand and could give you any job in the world, what would it be? And ninety-five percent of them haven't thought about it and don't know. And it's really exciting to watch them go. I don't know. And they go, oh, I'm playing a B-level orchestra, and if I could get some students, maybe, you know, and I said, no, it's a dream, <laughs> says mm. the big farmer sitting here, like, dream, like, go shoot for the moon, and fall a bit short, and she just gets stuck in the Chicago Symphony, you know, 
<laughs> whatever. But so have those dreams, and it's fun. I mean, that, I think this comes from me driving tractors in circles for 12 hours a day on the farm. I had to do something. So I memorized Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby routines, uh, and I spent a million dollars a thousand times. You know, I'll give Jay a black Porsche and Steve a red Porsche. You know, but oh, dreams yeah. and dreaming about this stuff and enjoy it. I had to spend the time anyway. Um, and to be, I help my students find successes in what they've done. It's really, really important. They have to strength collect after they do their performance at the beginning of the lessons. And we've given some guidelines to how to strength collect where it provides the most amount of learning. But and I free them up. <clears throat> they have, and I say, out of the hundreds of things you did really well, pick one of them and say something 100% positive about what you did. And how did it help you tell your story? More than I played a clean front on that one note, but to what end? What kind of story are you creating? Um, because the best performance in the world has a million mistakes with it, right? A computer can look at it and find a million mistakes. Second best performance, a million mistakes with that one too. So who are we to say performance one was better than performance two? Computer's going, nope, they both totally sucked. <laughs> They're rolling, well, look at all those mistakes, you know? So bask in this human imperfection and celebrate what we've done and stumble toward what we want and keep going to what to do. You look behind, I look behind myself, my path is covered with what not to do. But I've been stumbling forward toward what to do. I chase it, chase it, I keep chasing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it also strikes me because you, you sort of touched it. Is I think you have to love this deeply. Whatever this thing you're going to do is, you have to love it deeply. If you think about loving at this point or what love means, it's you know it amounts at this point in your life. Okay, you say you love your parents, or you love your grandparents, or you love your dog. I mean, to learn to love another human being who's not a relative of yours is a risky business. You know, you're gonna, you are gonna have your heart broken, and you should have your heart broken, meaning that that's part of the, the treachery and the beauty of what we are capable of giving each other. We give each other both those things, and I think with music, it's the same thing. It's, I think my husband actually had a great way of describing this. You know, music is like your mistress. And you have to love it with this sense of just, I must have this. And it has to be someone that you absolutely adore and that you would give anything for. I mean, I know this sounds this may be moral, moralistically difficult for some people to imagine this. But go beyond just the human morality of this subject. In other words, it's, it's something that's part of your life. You also have a life that you're living. But this mistress is somebody you cannot not have with you. And I think loving, loving of that kind of absolute must have, must be there for, my, for me, for my satisfaction and love and happiness. You have to think about your subject that way. You can't think of this as a, well, like a yoke around your neck or something that you're gonna have second doubts about. You know, you, you, if you love something, you're just gonna do your best to work at it. Don't think that it's, there is some, happy point where you get and it's just smooth sailing. I, I don't know, has it been smooth sailing for you? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh good, yeah. hey. <laughs> no, you, you came to it, like, good enough is the enemy of great. So what we're talking about is how to get a job in the music world or in the entrepreneur to start a business and I'm starting my first performance company again. Ah, lots of learning and everything, but I'm sticking to it and I'm totally, I'm, I'm not gonna quit. So I'm relaxed in it, I'm working very hard. But we're, this is this imperative to get this good at it. This is a competitive field out there. You're already good enough. <laughs> but the great part, this is the discerning. What we're talking about is that last 5%. You got into IU, that's already, you're fantastic. You know, but you're done with talent, I think. Talent gets you best in high school. The rest of it's a ton of hard work and maybe the talent is being able to learn and collect the lessons and, and make habits. That's maybe a talent you still have. But otherwise, it's how much do you want it and how early do you get up <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, to get excellent at it and to be the one that they choose to hire. One of the things on my inspirational sheet is make the decision easy for them. So like, oh, okay, we're gonna hire that one. But then let's discuss these two others that were close and kind of in the middle ground of the, but just be so, and, and you're not competing. Mozart's not competing, Williams Sisters, Tiger Woods, Heifetz, they're becoming the best they can be, right? On that way, if you compete, you lower your standards to other humans. <laughs> in there it's a great place and then share it then come out and share it with us <laughs> go back and build again I mean I think you'll learn from your students I think your students oh, yeah. will teach you you know that that actually I would think that that's, don't. 
Mine don't. Keep no, they don't. <laughs> Is that true? Did she hear that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she has words. Um, but I think, you know, that's part of this. You're, when you asked the question, I really felt you were talking from your end exclusively. And maybe what you were really saying is that you're worried about what you're, you go, the success you're going to have yeah, when you do really that. How to really help them. Yeah. Help well, they're the going to come to you like, believe me, they're going to come to you like blobs. They're going to be a blob, <laughs> and you're going to see this blob walk in, and it's going to have really fascinating sort of parts of itself. And then you're going to say, that's a fascinating blob. I can work with this blob. You know, I mean, when, when you're teaching, your early stages of teaching, you, you have to realize you come a lot more prepared than they are. And that's the relationship here. And as soon, it's like caring for somebody. You're, you're going to want to care for this person. You give them everything you can. And what you have is a lot compared to what they have. That's always going to be the case. You reminded me of also that we, I don't think I can teach anyone anything. You're providing the information. This blob is shaping itself. Good. And you've got to let go and let it shape itself at times, too, you know? And I'm, whoo, have you guys been teaching me that? This is my eighth year here, and it's just, it's amazing how much more I can let go. And I'm, I'm teaching better than ever, I think. Um, and, but a lot of it is that I don't make sure that they get the concept in the lesson anymore. They have to record their lessons. Um, but that I provide it, and then they do with it what they will. And if I and I remember my first couple of years here, I was like, really, I'm here. I have to say this a, a thirty times to mark this, and that you're da or whatever stuff. And, and they're in their actions going, I guess you do, you know. Until I totally let go of that, and yes, a huge part of my job is just reminding <laughs> over and over and over, and then just until they get it. There is no past. There's this moment. They need this, and be present with them, you know, and have them going somewhere. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't teach them anything, especially if they're not listening. If their dog just died, there's no teaching going on, right? It's they're in their their place, and they they'll come to it. But then you know the the uh, what is it the um, the net will appear when when you leap, <laughs> and the teacher will appear when the student is ready. <laughs> any any final thought or question? Anybody had a question that we're burning to ask? Can I move my studio into here? This room. <laughs> I know. Right? That would be nice. What about what about the three of you? Do you have any thoughts or questions? <clears throat> this was uh, really excellent. I think you all know how really good this was. And if you know their backgrounds and and, and their life as uh, performers and mainly as musicians, uh, you will see that they have spoken what they have lived. So it's, uh, it, it, this has been wonderful and wonderfully enlightening. I, I found one thing from both of them, and that was <clears throat> all of their comments came from a passion for music, not a passion for the horn or for the violin, but a passion for music. And without that, it ain't gonna happen. The mistress. <laughs> For those of you who wish to hold that image, actually, I have that. If somebody's interested in that little statement about the mistress, I have it in my room to all, to give you. It's it's a it's a much more comprehensive statement of this, and I I'm extracting it so it sounds a little bit <clears throat> cheeky, but it's not cheeky actually. It's it's about the rigor. There's a rigor to what you're doing, and I think anything that's good has rigor attached to it. Anything that's really meaningful in your life. Um, even going to Paris is rigorous. You get there and it's a great thing, but it takes rigor to get to the airport, you know, deal with everybody, your seat partner, you know, the <laughs> stewardesses, or I mean, everybody's just, you know, it's turbulence, whatever. Then you get past it and then you're there. But to get to something really meaningful, uh, and actually that can even mean inner peace, which means having to shut out everything, and that's rigorous to you too, to shut down all the noise in your life and just be peaceful, that takes a certain amount of rigor too. So I think there's just, there's a certain point in which don't think that there's a place where it just, you go into that, that gear and it's like, hmm, you know, don't have to do too much. Because that's when you're gonna get run into a pothole. So it's, it's just, you'll have moments when you're cruising and then believe me, that's gonna always be encountering something that's unexpected that's going to challenge you again. And 
That's the great thing. This is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Exactly. It's the best thing. Don't be yeah. don't not want that. Expect it and want it and there it is. Hey, it's there again. <laughs> that thing is there. Great to talk to you guys. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for coming. Thanks for having me.